Dante, and welcome to the Urban Aboriginal Voices Society. February 16 Community Learning Center, or should I say online program. My name is Jolene Gopher, and I will be your host for this event today. Today we will be treated to stories of our recent history in Red Deer by three people who have contributed to the Indigenous community for many decades, often behind the scenes. Before we start, as we do for any event, we have given our elder Lyle Richards protocol to smudge and pray for us. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I want to uh, thank the Urban Aboriginal Voices Society for offering me protocol to do the opening uh, smudge for this uh, learning opportunity. It's always a an honor to be uh, called upon to do these things and and to ask the uh, grandfathers and grandmothers to come and uh, be with us and and uh, bless the things that we're doing. So if you can uh, pray along with me in your own way, it would be uh, be great help to me. Um, and uh, I don't know if you like lighting candles. So that's a, that's a good thing to do. Whatever whatever way finds your way to sacred to the, to the divine. Um, take off the jewelry because uh, symbolically it's a way of uh, coming back to the creator in the same way he sent you. Oh, geez, whatever. Um, you know, and, that, and that's, that's symbolic because it's not polite to take the rest off. Anyway, so I will um, just do a, a bit of a smudge and then I'll do a short invocation and uh, we'll go from there. Fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, creator of all things, I want to thank you for this beautiful day. I want to thank you for this time together that we can uh, um, talk and share and then do the things that we need to do in order to help to the uh, community uh, learn some things and, uh, and come together and, and know some of the stuff that we went through in the beginning and some of the things that we're going to go through in the future. And uh, I really hope that uh, people get their... Uh, get their uh, you know, some benefit from this. So I thank you, uh, great creator, for all these things, and I ask you to look after those blessings for those people that are sick and suffering, especially those ones sick and suffering from the drugs and the alcohol, that they will return to our circle with uh, clean bodies and a straight mind. And all these things I pray in the name of the creator. Hey, hey. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Lyle Kiwaitan Richards, Morris Flewelling, and Glenn Manuluk to share their stories. Many things have changed for Indigenous people, and these men have been part of the change. It is now my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Lyle Kiwaitan Richards. Removed from his Cree mother at birth in the 60s school, he sought out his family as a young man and trained with the elders to learn his true culture. Later, as a trained social worker, we, he worked for the Alberta government in child and family services. As an Indigenous liaison or a bridge between CFS and the Indigenous community, he helped to create programs like the Aboriginal Frontline and Traditional Dance Program in Red Deer Public Schools. An Elders Advisory Forum for CFS, getting Indigenous issues and needs to local decision makers, and much more. Outside of work, he has also brought Indigenous culture and services to the city as a worker, and later president of the Red Deer Native Friendship Center, an advocate for many Indigenous issues, and now also as a community elder who brings prayers and shares his knowledge. He received the Indigenous Turtle Award for Lifetime Service, then Mayor's Special Award, and an honorary doc doctorate from St. Stephen's College. But most of us know him for his humor, wisdom, and encouragement. Good afternoon. I want to thank again uh, the uh, 
Herbert Aboriginal Voices uh, Society for giving me protocol to do the prayer and to, to have me come and, and speak. Um, it's, uh, it's funny, having been in Red Deer for 42 years, um, parked my daddy's motorcycle for the first time out front of the hotel across the street here and never really moved and it's been quite a, it's been quite a, it's been quite a journey. In the early days, uh, um, things were a little harsher than they are now and in some ways. Bertha and uh, Rosina always talk about, you know, uh, the uh, uh, residential school experience, like being called to talk about it. They finally said, I'm not going to do that anymore. He said, because every time we are called to talk about it, it's like taking a, a you know, scab and, and taking it off. And it's, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's like starting the, starting the bleeding all over again. So they said they don't want to do that. And so I want to try to stay away from as much of the, you know, sort of the, the harsh details, you know, of, of the old days, because I think most of the people know them, and, I'm, and I don't think it helps anymore to talk about it here. Um, I do think that, you know, we have to recognize that those things happened. I mean, uh, one of the uh, strawberry families were some of my first clients, and, uh, and that, was, uh, uh, that was some, uh, you know, should we say horrific times. And we have uh, bylaw officers that are still, you know, singling out Indigenous people. And uh, the last three commissioners of the RCMP said uh, that there's racism within the ranks of the, of the, uh, of the RCMP. Now, the last one, one we have now said that uh, there isn't any, so I guess she has some kind of a magic wand or something to make it all go away. But there's a certain, if you go to the Red Deer RCMP um, the lobby here, up on the ceiling you'll see stars. And I think it's a little bit of cultural insensitivity because if you remember the the uh, starlight rides, you know, in Saskatoon, you can imagine, you know, a, a relative of uh, Mr. Stonechild going down to the lobby and looking up and thinking about the last thing that his cousin saw. And it's on the ceiling here in Red Deer. You know, we have a, you know, there was a lot of stereotypes to get over and, and uh, we, uh, it, you, know, you think about, you know, what it is, you know, what these people went through and how they put one foot in front of the other. And, and, and if you really talk to these people, you know, you'd be surprised, you know, that it, only, it only took a six pack to get going this morning, not a, not a whole bottle. But, you know, it was, it was the 80s, you know, back then when uh, we uh, started uh, being asked to go places because people got, got start getting curious. You know, the Friendship Center was starting up. The uh, um, people would ask questions, you know, they didn't know quite how to handle different situations and whatnot, and, uh, and they would call us. They'd say, you know, uh, Lyle, come, come down and, and, and talk to us, you know, or, um, you know, do a, do a cultural awareness talk for the, uh, for the school. You know, so Miss Cora and I, a lovely lady, uh, would go down to the, these places and she'd talk about the Aboriginal veterans and, and, um, and I'd, uh, you know, bring you some, you know, I got a suitcase full of stuff and I'd tell stories and whatnot. And it was, it was wonderful. And, and eventually they, they uh, stopped calling us because they hired people of their own. You know, they're bred, you know, I think it was uh, the um, Aboriginal Frontline Program was, was, the first, uh, was the first program. They also started uh, bringing back lunches to schools, that program did. And that was uh, um, so good to see. You know, those sorts of things start up and because of, you know, they're masking us in and looking at the needs. The, um, Ms. Cora would also lay the wreath at the, uh, at the Cenotaph, you know, um, and Bill Ogden, that's, that's right, I forgot. And he was, uh, he was also one of our guys back in the 80s and early, and he uh, was a cancer patient, but he was also a Korean War veteran. And, um, you know, the people were kind of leery about us, you know, having, you know, a role in the, in the uh, uh, Remembrance Day ceremony. But uh, Bill logged and he uh, got himself out of his hospital bed, bought a $20, um, how do you call it, uh, Salvation Army suit. And he marched up to that cenotaph. He laid a, laid a wreath. Three weeks later, he was dead. It's amazing. But those kind of things, you know, were the things that uh, um, you take your, you take your, um, what would you say, your spirit from somebody like that. 
And uh, also in those days, we were doing a, a um, alcohol program. That's why I always remember the uh, the uh, people that are addicted in my prayers because you know we always uh, uh, we're you know we're working with them with the friendship center, and now we have the. Uh, um, well, variety program. It's probably the award-winning, actually, nationally award-winning well variety program, and they've uh, um, and it began really small, you know, again, as these things do. You know, we had a, a pilot project, uh, us and a couple of other friendship centers, and Tom Cranebear was hired on as our elder, and uh, he said, you know, there's a uh, uh, on every second corner here in Red Deer, there's a there's a steeple. You know where the Christians can go and do their thing, and well, there's nothing like that here for us. And he says, you know, we need something. So this is the original drawing that he gave me. You know, I think, well, he told me what to draw, and and, and I drew it. Um, and it, he called it uh, the Stone Circle, but he also called it Medicine Wheel. But he said we don't know what Medicine Wheels are. There's a lot of people who like to guess. But, you know, they are so ancient and so, you know, uh, uh, mysterious that, you know, people still bring rock, people still do ceremony there. But as far as their original origin, we don't know. But this was uh, is now down in Coronation Park and, uh, um, you know, and, and pointed towards uh, due north. Um, well, kind of. It's, it's street north. It turns out that the surveyors thing, uh, didn't know where the north scar was, but that's okay. <laughs> they tried. But it's it's really it's it's wonderful because it's 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 been adopted by the community and people will uh, will uh, will go by and they'll uh, uh, what's that and uh, when before they put the sign up they'd say um, it must be a sundial or it may be you know some other thing and there was it was really neat how uh, people began to make it their own and we when we dedicated it we must have had 120 people there. All sitting around and so on. Now that they were quite worried because there was also a wedding going on, and so we, but and so of course our drumming, you know, was going to be a problem for the people you know having the wedding. But when it was done, you know, we uh, took a blanket over to the to the wedding party, and congratulated them on their on their wedding, and and they accepted it. They said, no, no, we didn't, you know, we didn't, uh, we weren't bothered at all. We were really happy to you know to share the space with you. I said, well, that's that's the good news, isn't it? You know, and they were running for their cameras. I said, no, no, you just enjoy your bike. You know, that's, and that's, and again, I, you know, we, um, every time you cross a little bridge, and I think that that's really important. 36 years ago, um, we were out at Fort Normando, and uh, I was working for the Friendship Center at the time, uh, sitting in a teepee, and uh, the colonel who runs uh, the 65th Mount Royals comes along and he asked me for a match. And, and she, his wife, asked me for a match. So what do you need a match for? He says, well, I need a match to uh, light the cannon. And I says, just exactly who are you going to fire that uh, cannon at? He said, well, you know, we're reenacting the battle of, you know, the you know, batage and this kind of stuff. So you're asking me, sitting in a teepee, to give you a match so you can fire a cannon at me. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, you can do that, but you got to give me a gun. <laughs> he gives me, you know, so they gave me this little six shooter, and I sat over in the bush and I poked my up and fired a couple of rounds at him. And, uh, and they cheated because they, that was a nine pounder, and they fired back. <laughs> so I, I just kind of snuck away in the bushes. And I said, okay, we're going to be back next year. That was 36 years ago, and we're still, we're still out there, you know, doing the, doing the thing. Now, the other thing what we were doing at the same time is we began having sweats out there. And between uh, uh, Morris and uh, uh, Jim, who ran the, who ran the uh, uh, what was it, back in Kerrywood Nature Center back then, you know, we came up with a with a uh, kind of a handshake agreement that said, "We'll help you out with Fort Normando days. You help us out with a you know little spot of land that they had up in the corner there, where we can do our sweats and whatnot." And that's been going on ever since. And right now, Safe Harvest Society has one of the you know the, one of the best programs. I think in, in, in central Alberta for sure, you know, that uh, brings people through there again for sobriety. And so, you know, we're working our way past these things. Um, it's not to say that there's an odd issue still out there. I mean, there's, there's lots of them. You know, we still got to, you know, figure out a, the, the <laughs> what do you call it, the uh, formula for Clearview Ridge. We still got to uh, uh, figure out, uh, well, there's lots of things. I mean, the whole racism thing. 
you know, uh, uh, the President Payne told it. When we, had a, when we had the Black Lives Matter and the Indigenous Lives Matter rally, the second one, um, because the first one, you know, we were, we were attacked. But the second one, the, the, the RCMP were out in force. And it turns out to protect your freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, and, and so on like this, yes, it requires a helicopter. And it requires a lot of overtime. But those young people were allowed to go and they were allowed to come to City Hall Park and express themselves in the way that they needed to and they were protected at that time. I think that's really important. It was uh, a lot of people who were saying, you know, what is, you know, who paid for that helicopter? Well, everybody did because that's what it cost to have your freedoms protected. So I think that the things that are really important now, you know, again, the grandfathers was one of the best, one of the best things I think that's, that's ever happened. I mean, I, I, really, I wanted to put it in City Hall Park, but Morris kicked me out of the table and told me to just mark up and give, give the real story. But, but uh, down, down at Coronation Park, we figured that would never happen. They, they offered us a spot at, in, up at Heritage Ranch where nobody could get to, and then they offered us a spot in Heritage Square that was only about that big around. Uh, okay, uh, so we hang in, you know, but at uh, 2013 on the uh, centennial of the city of Red Deer, uh, we figured that out and we got a, uh, what was a, a bobcat. Now, one of the best stories from there is uh, that the uh, guys that uh, live in that park, uh, there's a lot of people who are homeless in that, and, and live in that park. They saw what we were doing, they put down all those stones, it pouring rain that day. And we put a tobacco one in each one of them. You know, and they put them down. And so they came over and talked to us. What are you guys doing? What's, what's, what's going on here? And we told them why. And, and then they went back and they talked. Every one of them, they talked you know, to, about what, you know, what, what it was. And, and so they kind of started nodding their heads. And they come over. Now, these guys have to pick cigarette butts out of, out of, uh, out of um, mastery you know, on the street you know, to get their tobacco. But they came along and they put little pieces of tobacco on each one of them stones. And again, you got to admire people who uh, can take their last, uh, you know, five dollars and give it to you, or their last tobacco. It's a real honor for me, you know, um, to see you know when I started uh, Friendship Center. I was there when the Friendship Center got their first funding for the uh, uh, from the federal government for the uh, what they call core funding, uh, you know, to pay for the uh, um, director a bookkeeper secretary and one one other worker and some rent that same money as they get now but anyway it's uh uh but that was it i mean that was you know they were uh they were the, the service in town at that time there was a little bit from the from the mat local but you know this again this is in the 80s and um well we uh, i i got in there as a native um oh Native outreach worker. That was an employment uh, program, and we were trying to uh, uh, wondering where all, where all the Indians were. And uh, so, of course, the, the story came to us that uh, the uh, social services would only uh, um, give people bus tickets. And so, if they applied for welfare and they were a treaty Indian, they were given bus tickets back to their home reserve or back to wherever it was they came from. He says, well, how does that work? So we got a hold of our MLA, then John Oldring, and he says, that, that doesn't sound right. There's something, something, something funny about that. So he started looking around, and sure enough, he came, around, came up with a memorandum of understanding between the federal government and the province. And in that memorandum, it said, if a treaty Indian comes to live in a urban area, that the federal government will reimburse the province for their... Um, uh, welfare payments. And so I took that out to the then director out, at, out in Ennisville and kind of put it on his table and said, well, how come this isn't happening? You know, people just get these bus tickets rather than, the, you know, than getting yeah, picked up. And he said, oh, well, you know, this thing doesn't, doesn't uh, pay for administration, you know, and I'm kind of going, well, I don't think that that is sort of the, the spirit of this thing. And I think that maybe you should ought to reconsider that the very next day. The first person got that, and that was 1986. So that was um, so ever ever after when people come to town, they've got that memorandum of understanding to to thank. But 
talking from you know, because he said you know, the reason we give him the bus tickets is because there's no um, Aboriginal services in Red Deer, you know, to help them. I say, well, just a second. <laughs> We're working at the Friendship Center, and uh, um, and we'd like to be the services. And the uh, and he kind of went, oh well, okay, well, see how it goes. Well, sure enough, we got uh, um, Friendship Center going, and then I think we counted uh, uh, the other night eleven Indigenous agencies or Indigenous. Uh, um, um, Indigenous uh, um, programs, you know, that are that way. There is uh, the UAVS, of course, with the domains and the elder circles. Remembering the Children's Society, you know, with uh, Remembering the Children's Day on June 11th. Uh, we got a protocol agreement with the city that uh, Joe, Jojo mentioned earlier. Now we're still learning how to, you know, how to put that together, how to get uh, get the the, the the, the issues to the table and, and, and chew on them in a good way. I talked about the Clearview Ridge before, and, and again, that's a sort of thing that we need to do. Um, as it, remembering the children, we've got a marker, you know, in, in the graveyard, you know, to remember those four kids that died from the uh, from the uh, pandemic in the eighteen uh, in the nineteen eighteen nineteen nineteen. And um, we had a ceremony this year. It was uh, you know during the pandemic. And people said, "Well, we can't do that. You know, it's uh, you know we're we're restricted." And I said, "Well, yeah, of course we're restricted, but we have to do it because these people need to know that one, it happened before, and two, that we can do it again and we can survive." And so we did. For the thirty-four people showed up. We were allowed fifty, and thirty-four people showed up, and uh, and uh, there was elder there, there were the preachers there, a number of the folks from the community, and they uh, um, all came together to honor those kids. And uh, and to remember that you know that this has happened before, and that we're able to uh, survive. Um, people kept asking. Actually, one of the, one of the, wor the worst thing, one worst problems we had was a lot of the uh, ladies from the church were quite concerned that we weren't able to have coffee. And how are we going to serve coffee? <laughs> because that was a very important part of you know being hospitable to those guests that came. And well, we didn't have. We weren't able to do that. We have. Uh, um, Redder College. The other, uh, the other day, I was part of the uh, uh, education conference, and uh, um, the president uh, got up and said uh, that uh, the board has officially uh, endorsed the UN uh, Declaration of Rights of the Indigenous People and the um, TRC, uh, and that those those guidelines are going to be. Uh, what um, is going to guide them in, in dealing with the Aboriginal people, and I, and I thought that that was that was a really good thing because uh, um, those are the kind of things that uh, really going to help. Marie Sinclair, who's the head of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, once said, "The same evil that existed within the residential schools now exists within the child welfare agencies, or within the child welfare system." And um, I'm going to end where I started and with talking about uh, the elders, Bertha and Rosina. Bertha used to sit on the elder circle with the Children and Family Services uh, um, uh, elder circle. And um, what, every, every time, and there must have, we must have met, well, met must, monthly for years. And every single time she was there, she says, let's get them children home. Thank you, Lyle. Our next speaker is Glenn Maniluk, whose heritage on one side of the family is traced back to the Le Pierre La Pelche from trois Rivieres, Quebec around 1774. And some of the his history identifies Aboriginal woman with the family tree. Glenn has worked in schools in Alberta for 50 years. He's been a teacher a Department of Education consultant, superintendent, and a social worker specializing in helping Indigenous families. He worked as an early intervention specialist and contract speci specialist for Indigenous programs with children's services, encouraging and funding many good programs like Métis Links, Aboriginal Healthcare Liaison Worker Services, 
and Aboriginal family and school frontline liaison workers. Glenn has also played an important part to the Indigenous community. Helping to save the Friendship Centre as president, helping to secure a Suaham crossing, and supporting Indigenous causes. When Red Deer's Indigenous community celebrated its most celebrated When Red Deer's Indigenous community celebrated its most worthy members with the Turtle Awards, Glenn was awarded the Education Award for his contribution to Indigenous education. Now retired, except from farming and sitting on the Elder Circle, he has played a part in many changes that have come to our community. Good afternoon, Glenn Manalik. I'd like to uh, thank the Urban Aboriginal Voices Society for inviting me here today to talk about education. Uh, I'm retired now, but I spent about 50 years in many facets of education. And I've been asked to bring some stories, I guess going back to where education was, as I viewed it at the time, uh, where it's kind of evolved to, and maybe some direction that I would suggest we need to look at for the future relative to Aboriginal people. If I were to start out with my stories, I guess I would go way back to the early 70s, about 1970 in fact. I was a social studies teacher in St. Albert and I was teaching social studies and I decided here I am in, in a basically a community that once had a strong Métis background or history, and I thought, I need to teach uh, about Louis Riel, um, the Battle of Batoche, the trial of Louis Riel, and this was to grade 10s. Now at the time, there wasn't anything in the curriculum relative to Métis or First Nations people, Inuit, um, and so I constructed um, a lesson that was more than one, uh, we seemed to go on for about a month because we took the trial of Louis Riel and, and actually I had a, uh, the students act different parts and uh, even had a jury of students. But interesting at the time, there was, in Calgary, they were attempting to name a school after Louis Riel. Well, the radio stations uh, call in Sessions lit up and people were talking about, oh, how can we do this? He was a traitor. He was a rebel. Um, and so the school wasn't named after him. But I guess part of my presentation at that time was that really Louis Riel was the actual, became the actual legal head of the first government in Manitoba. Now, it only took about another 30 years for government to recognize that fact. I also taught and tried to get the students to understand that though the view by the books that were present in the libraries was that, oh yes, uh, the brave Canadian soldiers charged the Métis people and as soon as they did that, they ran. It was really quite the opposite. The Métis soldiers were very adept, very brave, very, very good sh sharp shooters and uh, had kept uh, the Canadian soldiers from charging for about four days. In fact, at one point they even had them surrounded, but that's another story. Interesting enough though, um, at the end of all this, uh, I went looking for my jury of students as to how they were going to find this whole case. And I found them in a, in a, in a corner of a room and they were, they were just really into the whole lesson and the court case. They came back in and the decision was he was innocent. The, I guess that was my first kind of foray into supporting the Aboriginal position in education. Now in the 80s, I became an educational consultant, well, with the Department of Education, actually in the 70s. But in the 80s, we used to go out and 
evaluate schools and make recommendations for improvement. Uh, we were invited by, at the time, Hobima, now Muscatchis, but Ehrman Skin Band to come out and evaluate their schools. My job was to evaluate the school library in one of their junior high schools. And it was kind of interesting because I went into the library and began to look around, uh, began to look at the collection, and basically I was floored. Here was a large collection of Aboriginal stories and books that placed the Aboriginal people as savages, as needed to be reformed, needed to be uh, civilized, etc. cetera. Um, I was kind of shocked by the collection and, and one book which I should have taken with me <laughs> because it was, it was extreme, but I have this visual image of it. And here's a, the cover of the book. Here's a little white girl in a nice little pink dress. She was down on her knees in front of a white picket fence and a gate and a white house behind. And you look up in the picture and here's a large Indian warrior. And he's got her by long hair and he's got a tomahawk over top of her. And I went, oh gee. <laughs> well, I then, thought, this is, this is too much. I got a hold of the um, superintendent's called Director of Education uh, for Indian Affairs and said, you have to come down here and see this library because you've got to do something about this. He came down, I showed him that book, and of course, all the other books. I wrote a report at the time, probably the most scathing report I'd ever written and recommendations about this school library and how it had to change. Uh, for the next two years, I would get calls from the school. You've got to come out and see us. We've, so they did take it to heart and, and made several changes to correct what was abysmal. Now, during our evaluation, it was kind of interesting, too, because we went in as a team. At that time, there were no Aboriginal teachers. In fact, all the teachers were from out of country and new to Canada. Little did they know anything about Canada, little did they know anything about Aboriginal people. And one of the things we brought forward at the time, you have no expectations for your Aboriginal students. Um, you need to really improve this. One of our other findings was, gee, there's, we identified there was about 2,000 students who were not at school. So it was quite a finding at the time, and we, then went on, with, they had built a new school after, not on our basis, but they realized the Indian affairs that they really had to improve how they approached education for Aboriginal people. Now there was another reserve too later on that we um, just out west, I won't name the reserve, but when we evaluated that school as well, we found uh, similar issues. Plus some of the teachers, again, no Aboriginal teachers, some of the teachers themselves had their own issues, some mental issues. And later on, when I was back in the office, I had the uh, principal of the school call me and say, said, Glenn, um, I've got to go back to Manitoba. I, I'm not going to stay here anymore. I said, well, why not? She said, there are too many issues. And he said, you know what? I said, what? She said, there's never been a student to graduate from here. So in the 70s, 60s, 80s, education for Aboriginal people was uh, way down the list of importance. Now, the Department of Education did have a unit which dealt with Aboriginal. They had consultants that went out, but you know, you've got an entire school system and maybe three or four consultants to try and promote um, education for Aboriginal. Now later on, 1996 to the area of, well, about 2002, I started work with children's services. I was at the time called an early intervention specialist. Anyway, I worked with Lyle, the previous speaker, 
And we had 52 pilots around uh, in central Alberta that we funded. One of the criteria for funding, communities would make, would make proposals to us, but one of the criteria was that you had to address the needs of Aboriginal people within your community. Now, when I received proposals, I would usually go out to the site and uh, ask them about their proposal. Um, almost consistently, I would look at and, and the proposal and find there were no, there was no strategies um, to address the needs of Aboriginal people. And I'd ask the community people about this. Why, why haven't you addressed this? Oh, they said, it's not a problem. I said, why isn't it a problem? And they would say, well, there's no Aboriginal people in our community. Oh. Well, Lyle and I had some statistics on and information provided by government. Yes, there were Aboriginal people living in the community. So at that time, my response was, you need to find those Aboriginal people. You need to talk with them. You need to find out what their issues are and needs are. And you need to address those in your proposal. If you didn't, so sorry, but we wouldn't be funding your proposal. So there was a great scramble by many people in the community to actually connect with Aboriginal people who were to them invisible within their community. Now, later on, I started working with Aboriginal Frontline with the Red Deer Public. And we also provided services to the Red Deer Catholic school system. One issue that really st struck me at the time was, whoa, are we way behind in some of our needs? And uh, I had a parent approach me, who I knew quite well, an Aboriginal parent, Métis, and she said, Glenn, I'm really, really mad. <laughs> I'm going to tear somebody's throat out at the, in the school system, at the central office. I said, what's the problem? Well, she said, my son came home and asked me, Mom, we had a test today. And within the test, that was on Aboriginal people, and within the test, one of the questions was, what do you call an Aboriginal or Indian person, a woman? Answer, squaw. And it was, it was so when we began in, you know, to investigate and try and find out how did this happen, the teacher was in all innocence, didn't know anything about Aboriginal culture, was asked to try and work something in, into their lesson, went to a file cabinet, pulled out an old test, so oh, this is ideal, I use this, and gave it to the class with little or no knowledge of just how bad that test was, how racist that test was. That, of course, was corrected, but it, those were kind of the early days of, of education related to trying to support Aboriginal people. It wasn't. It was, in fact, not doing anything for Aboriginal kids or students. Now, during the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the needs of educational people, as I said, were very, very low, almost non-existent. Now, later on, as we began to merge into the 90s, 80s, into the, through the 90s, um, Red Deer Public uh, developed uh, a program called Aboriginal Family and School Frontline Workers, Liaison Workers Program. This also served the needs of, and was supported by Red Deer Separate. Now, what really got things moving was that in about 2004, the Department of Education laid out four major goals, educational goals for Aboriginal students. Student achievement was to increase. School environment is to be respectful and appreciates culture, history, and the worldview. Barriers to learning success were supposed to be identified and removed. And the fourth one, parents are involved in school community and see school as inviting and engaging. And I think that began to 
spur across the province a major shift in public education to begin to look at some real needs for Aboriginal students. Schools began to bring in Aboriginal awareness sessions for teachers through the Frontline Project, uh, through uh, teachers that went out and worked with other teachers and Aboriginal teachers who brought culture, talked about culture with teachers. But that was in the city system. Uh, basic rural, within the rural school systems, there was not as much emphasis. Now today, as we move forward, um, we have, uh, for instance, a Aboriginal person from the Friendship Center who is hired to go into schools to bring cultural sessions to teachers and to classes. Uh, I think there have been many, many different strategies that have been introduced by units within both the public and the separate schools. And I've seen the awareness increase tremendously about the needs of Aboriginal students. But there's still, if I move to the future, where would we go with all this? I think there is now a need that we need to address, and that is the social and psychological needs of Aboriginal students. I think this is a new frontier that we need to look at. The word intergenerational trauma has been tossed around by the media, but overall, we know little about it but it has very long-term effects on Aboriginal families and youth. How often have you heard of the effect, the bad effects of residential schools? And how often have you heard, why can't they just get over it and move on? Well, the reason is the effects of intergenerational trauma. And there were two large reports that were put out that really began to focus and deal with these issues from a research basis. One is Aboriginal people and historical trauma. The process of intergenerational transmission, which describes a lot of research in the area. The other one is addressing the healing of Aboriginal adults and families within a school community. These were both put out by the National Collaborating Center for Aboriginal Health. Now, Dr. Bruce Perry, a well-known uh, psychologist, um, psychiatrist, sorry, in the U.S., has researched and refined the significant effects of trauma on children. He actually spent two years heading the Alberta Mental Health Department here. That's one thing we're looking at trauma from individual significant catastrophic events. But if you add in the long-term interge intergenerational effects, you have a longer, more impactful effect on children and youth. And within even the research within this document talks about such things as hypoarousal, inability to self-regulate on students, moving to anger, rage quickly, kids always in a state of alarm, Children grow up to be impulsive, aggressive, withdrawn, and have difficulties in relationships, persistent fight or flight. I spent 18 years working as a social worker, counselor within the schools, and I can't tell you how many times that I have worked with youth that show these issues and difficulties within, within schools. This is a huge area of need. What we, I think, need to do for the future, because now we have curriculum that addresses the education, knowing about Aboriginal culture and history. But what we haven't begun to really address is how do you work with, support, and provide education to these youth who display intergenerational trauma symptoms. Now, too many drop out of school before they reach high school. Often, I found grades eight, nine, and 10. Within this, this booklet, 
there is um, a statistic that basically says only 9.8% of Aboriginal Canadians obtain a university degree compared with 26.5% of non-Aboriginal Canadians. Educational attainment is a major detriment of employment status and income. So we've got a long way to go yet. We need to educate teachers, social workers, counselors on how to support these youth. Remember, it's taken generations to get to this point. It will take a large effort to hope to turn around these youth and the issues that they are displaying. Remember, they one day will become parents and their children will repeat these issues. Intergenerational trauma will continue unless we make a significant move within school systems to begin to address these mental issues that are derived from the intergenerational trauma. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is Morris Flewelling, who most of us know first as city councillor and then as mayor, who gave 16 years of dedicated service to our city. Morris has also been a teacher and an executive director of the Red Deer Museum, watching and helping to support Indigenous programs behind the scenes. He played a major part in installing the first Indigenous display at the Red Deer Museum. He strongly influenced the giving of land to the Friendship Centre for the Asuaham project. He participated in and encouraged a four-year cycle of feasts for the dead children of the Red, Red Deer Industrial Indian School. His was the final push that got the grandfather's stone circle installed in Coronation Park. He has been honored for his years of support by being adopted in the traditional way by a local elder and given as an, an indigenous name. He has, of course, received many awards, including an honorary doctorate for university from the University of Alberta. Today, we're going to enjoy something we all know him for, his stories, gentle humor, and knowledge. Dante Morris, and welcome. Thank you for sharing with us today. Good afternoon. I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank the Urban Aboriginal Voices for the invitation to come and speak about education and politics, two of my very favorite subjects. Um, I'd like to say thank you for the introduction and also thank Lyle for his smudge and prayer. I grew up in a small town in central Alberta, Mirror. It was a railroad town. We had almost no contact during the 1940s and 50s when I was there with Indigenous people. Usually the only thing we ever saw was an occasional family would arrive with the kids and the dogs and the horses and they would cut fence posts and do fencing for local farmers, but they never stayed long and they weren't part of our community. The only other contact I had was when I was very young. The war was on, my father was overseas, and my mother used to take us, or take me with her, to spend the winter with her family in Manitoba. And my grandmother was one of these people who ran the general store and was the postmistress, was the nurse, she was the choir master in the church and the organist. And on Sunday, she used to go with the United Church minister out to the local reserve, and she played the piano for the services. So when the people from the reserve came into, into Decker, they very often camped just below the store along the creek and by the railway. And there was one lady, her name was Sue Ben, and Sue Ben was an older uh, member of that, that group. And she would come up to the apartment above the store early in the morning, 
And she would sit by my grandmother's bed very quietly. And then when my grandmother stirred and wakened up, Sue Ben would go out and she'd lit the fire previously. And so she'd put the kettle on and make tea and bread and butter. And she and my grandmother, and by this time I'd be up, and so I'd crawl into bed as well, and we'd sit and talk. And I was always impressed with these two old ladies with their long braids, and they would sit and talk very gently and share stories. And that was my first introduction at all to people who were not basically European settler types. Well, then... I got to grade four and my school teacher announced that she was a Métis. And in trying to explain to me what a Métis was, my father said, well, there were some early Métis people who were here. Their names were Mr. and Mrs. O.D. Cook and their house was still out on the lake shore, abandoned. We used to play in it once in a while. But my father also took me down to Tail Creek Cemetery. And that was in the days when they had the little spirit houses and it was a very beautiful and quiet spot. And we were in the funeral business, so he said the last person I buried here was in 1938. There were a number of graves. However, I notice now that a fire has gone through, burned all of the wooden markers in the spirit houses, and there's now a boulder with a bronze plaque on it with all of the names. And it just doesn't have the same impact as the little old Tail Creek Cemetery. Well, then I moved to Red Deer to start my teaching career. And among the first people I met was Doug Cardinal because uh, St. Mary's Catholic Church was being built at the time. Doug was around and his sister Joan, who late sister Joan, who was the artist. And uh, Doug told me a very interesting story that I think is instructive both from political and educational aspects. He said that as a young Métis, he had the credentials and applied to go to UBC School of Architecture. And he went for an interview and they said, yes, you have the credentials, but given your background, we just don't think there's a place for you here at UBC. And of course, he was crushed by that. However, he went on to do his architectural studies at the University of Texas, graduated, came to Red Deer, was designed and was building St. Mary's Catholic Church, which by the way, interestingly enough, is the first computer designed, computer assisted design of any building in the world. And uh, so he, he was sharing this story with me but he said, you know, in the end, University of British Columbia, now that I was a, an architect of some note, invited me to come and give a lecture at the university. And he said, I did it, and I was graceful and generous in, in doing it. But it just shows you how, um, how that would have been a real a preventer for him. And another part of the Métis culture that I remember is as a young teacher I came to Red Deer and there was Brian St. Germain and Brenda St. Germain were in my classes and as you know both of those people went on to be leaders in the education field and in and in uh, assisting their people and the third person who was a Métis at the time excuse me was Ray St. Dennis who is well known to all of the people as one of our leaders in the community in Red Deer. Also, while I was teaching, I was boarding at a place in Alex. And uh, I was the grade seven teacher and the grade one teacher also boarded at this place. And she was a Japanese national. And one day we were listening to the news at lunchtime and she said, oh, shh, shh, shh. And we stopped talking and listened to this piece. And it was a, something about the Japanese internment where the Japanese people had been removed from the coast, had their property confiscated and moved to interior BC as part of a war measure. And she said, well, my family lost our fishing boat, our house. My mother lost, grandmother lost her grand piano. We were moved inland. My grandmother died while we were at Silver City. 
and we ended up in Tabor, the sugar beet farms later on after the war. And I said, she said, you know about that? And I said, no, I don't know anything about that. I didn't. I was 20 years old. I'd been a good student in school, but that had never been covered in school. And so the reason I introduced that story is I want to talk about how important it is in curriculum, what we include and what we don't include. And right now, Alberta is in the process of reviewing its curriculum for all studies and all grades, K to 12. And we must be on top of it to make sure that everything appropriate for Indigenous culture is included in the curriculum. Another instance of this very same thing was that when uh, Dr. Carter, who was the speaker in the legislature, published a book called Behind Barbed Wire, I discovered at that time that there were prisoner of war camps in Alberta, one in Lethbridge and one in Medicine Hat. Never had ever this been talked about in school, never had it ever been talked about in society. And finally, my third experience was as mayor, I was invited to attend the Sudanese Liberation Front celebration. And I thought, I wonder what this is all about. So I went early and I singled out one of the Sudanese leaders there. I said, tell me about what we're doing here and why don't I know anything about Sudan after having taught Africa in grade nine for years where we dealt with all of the countries, but never Sudan. I said, was it a French or a German or a Dutch protectorate? I mean, who colonized it? He said, no, it was Britain. But he said, in 1963, when we decided, when we were granted our independence from Britain, the people of Sudan, who are a divided people anyway, because in the, in the north, you have the sort of uh, Muslim people, and in the south, you have the black Christian peer people. So there's a natural divide in the country anyway. He said, we decided that we were not going to be part of the British Commonwealth. And the result of that was that the Alberta curriculum knocked them off the curriculum because they were not part of the British Commonwealth. If you weren't part of the Commonwealth, you weren't going to get taught in Alberta schools. So it's that little twist there that I think is so important. And I, I really believe that people should be very careful about um, uh, curriculum. Then I encountered Ethel Taylor. Ethel Taylor is remembered in Red Deer for the drive and the bridge. But for those of us who knew Ethel, we are much, much more aware of the leadership she gave in education and schooling and libraries and child welfare. And she was an early friend of Daisy Crowchild from Morley. And these two women together managed to assist the formation of Masquachese College and helped get the college uh, underway. And it was through Ethel and Daisy that my wife Hazel, who was operating for the public school system, a program called the Challenge Program. And one of the learnings in the challenge program that Hazel had for bright grade five students was to go to Basquachese, which of course then was called Hobima, and to meet with Teresa Wildcat and some students from Basquachese. And so each week Hazel would load up seven or eight kids and they'd go up to uh, Basquachese and they would meet with Teresa and her mother, Mrs. Mind, who is also an outstanding person in terms of education in, in Alberta. And they would operate this afternoon program. And I just want to quote something from uh, Teresa. She said, and I quote, education is the key to the survival of the Indian people. And I think we need to remember what Teresa was saying at that time. So anyway, they had this several weeks of, uh, of exposure. And the three really interesting quotes came out of that. Our little son, who was about four and a half or five, went with Hazel on these excursions. And they got there and he was 
hyped up and ready to do all this program with the big kids. And so they got there and they met Teresa and they met the other kids and David turned to Hazel and he said, Mom, where are all the Indians? And she said, well, they're right here. Teresa's an Indian and Brian is an Indian, her son, and, and Grandma Mind. Anyway, that was one of the quotes. And then on the way home one day, one of the little boys, who's now an emergency room physician in Red Deer, he was very quiet. He peeled his orange, and Hazel said he was very contemplative. And she, Hazel said, what is it, David, that, that's getting to you? And he said, well, I'm just thinking. He said, when I went up to Masquachese, he said, I expected that Teresa's house and the rest of the place would be really dirty. And it wasn't. And he said, I don't know where I got that idea. And if I had that idea, I must have some other crazy ideas. That was the second one. And the third one was, one of the little girls was doing her loom weeding and loom beading, and she'd finished it, and she'd set it aside, and Teresa was examining it, and she took it over and showed it to her mother, Mrs. Mind. And uh, she said, this is, this is really well done. And Mrs. Mind said, yes, not bad for a white child. <laughs> and then she put her hand over her mouth and said, oh, what have I said? And of course, it was just those times. Um, and out of that whole thing, I'm delighted to be able to relate that education was always under the control of the federal government through um, the uh, Indian Affairs. And local bands and uh, of First Nations did not have control over their education. However, I am happy to share with you that the four First Nations at Masquachese have recently got together over the last few years, and they have adopted their own local school board, which was a first in Canada, and they've adopted their own control and funding of education, and they appointed Brian Wildcat as their superintendent. And Brian Wildcat was about 10 years old when Hazel used to go up to work with Teresa and her mother. Lyle has already mentioned the, the sweat lodge in Red Deer, and that is a really interesting uh, story because I was the director of the museum and in charge of Fort Normando at the time, among other things. And Lyle was working in the archives, and he came to me and he said, we need a place for a, a sweat lodge, and I'm wondering if we could think about getting permission to put one at, at uh, Fort Normando. And we talked about it, and I said, you know, Lyle, I think it would be easier to do it and ask forgiveness than it would be to ask permission. Because if we ask permission, it'll have to go up the pipe and down the pipe. And chances are the answer might be no. And then we'd be stymied. So we just did it. And as Lyle said, 36 years later, we're still doing it. And we have the support of everybody in, in doing just that. And so in my career in the museum, one of the early exhibits that we introduced was we took a section of the permanent gallery, which is a gallery where you put exhibits in and they remain for a number of years. And we, we found that in many community museums, there was no place for indigenous culture. There were sometimes a few arrowheads and stone pounders and, and a few things like that. But really, museums in Alberta tended to deal with settlers and the coming of and the building of the community. So we decided that we would build an exhibit and it was called Where the Old Man Slept and it was to deal with the dog days before rifles and horses. Rifles coming from the north and horses coming from the south which changed the, the culture considerably. So we developed this very large exhibition that occupied a third of the gallery and then we got the bright idea that if we were going to do this right, we were going to put all the text and labels in both English and French and Cree syllabics. And it was through Lyle 
and his connections at Masquiches with Alex Gray Eyes and Albert Lightning that we got the elders there to translate the labels and the text. And to my knowledge, that is the first exhibit in Canada that ever had Cree syllabics as part of the exhibit. An exhibit that became very controversial was The Spirit Sings. It was mounted in Calgary at Glenbow and was part of the uh, 1988 Olympics. It was not well received by the Indigenous people and there were some land claims going on with the Lubicons up north and so it was a time of quite unrest. There were a lot of demonstrations against the exhibit and so on. It went to Ottawa and it got even hotter down there. It was really quite ugly. And so um, I was president of the Canadian Museums Association at the time and I decided that we had to do something and so I uh, connected with Phil Fontaine, who is the Assembly of First Nations Grand Chief, and I said, what can we do here? And we agreed that we would hold a conference. It was called Turning the Page. We had 400 people there in 1992. And out of that came a set of protocols for dealing with Indigenous material and Indigenous stories and, and human remains and so on. Um, I'm happy to say that 25 years later, we had a conference in Kelowna to see where that had gone. And I was staggered at the amount of repatriation of artifacts and bodies and body parts and sensitive spiritual things that had been returned from museums all over the world to, to the Canadian um, First Nations. While I was mayor, I had a lot of opportunity to uh, to interact with Indigenous people and one of my initiatives was to set up sort of irregular every second month meetings with a group called the Urban Elders and that proved to be a very useful connection for me as mayor with the Indigenous community. I did the same thing by inviting the six chiefs of the six First Nations that are closest to uh, Red Deer to join. I said look I operate a municipal government, in a sense, you and your van, or you and your council operate a municipal government, but we never talk to one another. And I think the most critical example of that was when we, when we Red Deer, Black Falls, Lacombe, developed a water line that would take treated water from the Red Deer River up to those communities because their wells were going dry, and up to Pinoka that we wanted to hook on Hobima, or Masquiches at the time, but because of the complications with the negotiation and the lack of local decision-making in Masquiches, they got left off the end of the line, and that made me very, very sad, and that's what spurred me to talk to the chiefs. Then we had Urban Aboriginal Voices, the pilot project in Grand Prairie, Red Deer, and Edmonton. We now know where that has taken us. We're now in the process of finalizing a, a system where we have government to government speaking. Also, as a member, uh, member of city council and the mayor, I was invited to be an honorary witness in 2014 at the uh, Truth and Recreation uh, Commission when it met here in Red Deer for the second time. And that was a very powerful experience. And finally, I'll conclude by adding to Lyle's story about the stone circle. Um, as mayor, we were about to celebrate our 2000 in 2013, our 100th anniversary as a city. And as I watched everything go by in the planning, I realized that there was nothing from the Aboriginal community that was coming forward. And I said, we cannot have this celebration without including the Indigenous people. So in desperation, I called Lyle. I said, Lyle, we got a problem. We need to do something and I need your help. And Lyle said, Remember that stone circle map that Tom Crane Bear drew 25 or 30 years ago? He said, I think it's time. And we'd agreed it was time. So we formed a little ad hoc committee and Lyle brought the diagram forward. Everybody liked the idea. It wouldn't cost much. It could be done quickly. It would be a permanent reminder and so on. And then it came, well, where were we going to put it? 
And I remember Lyle suggesting that, well, City Hall Park would be ideal in some respects, but it would never happen because you can't get anything but a petunia in City Hall Park. So then Lyle said, well, what about Barrett Park? Should be near the creek, should be quiet, meditative. What about Coronation Park? I said, I don't think you'll ever get it there, but you might try asking. Lyle went to the, the Parks Department they fell all over it. They thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. Lyle pointed out to them that the treaties had been made with the Queen's great grandmother and that it was a perfect place for the, the park or for the stone circle to be. So the grandfather stones came to be uh, located in Coronation Park and have been a strong symbol of unity in the community ever since 2013. So thank you very much for allowing me to share some of my thoughts. Thank you, Morris. The next learning circle will be with Elder Lynn Jonason, sharing cultural traditions around naming children and family ways. It will be on May 30th at 1.30 on the same Facebook site. Just to note, the Urban Aboriginal Voice Society is a com community group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous allies who have been a steadily growing voice for Indigenous needs and rights in Red Deer. The society is divided into committees, or what we call domains. Some of our work includes building an Indigenous-led justice process, which will help to reduce the number of Indigenous people who serve time for minor offenses and helps them heal. Building and implementing a protocol agreement with the City of Red Deer to provide a community-driven Indigenous voice to city operations. Working with Red Deer Hospital to educate staff and provide cultural opportunities and collaborating with other groups to bring Indigenous traditions and celebrations to the city. For more information, or if you would like to be a part of this, please contact us at 403-505-4049. That is 403-505-4049 or through our web, website, Red Deer Urban Aboriginal Voices Society. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and we sincerely hope to see you again. of our language and stories Kids with the key they took us away Locked us in schools to bring a brighter day All the things we used to know All of them gone Gone with the buffalo Trade our souls, they got in the way. Buck skins burning, heads bowed to pray. They opened their Bible, said it held the truth. For all our godless elders and their misspent youths, all the spirits.